and we're live. So welcome everyone. Thank you for joining the live stream. We'll start right at 2 p.m. Central Time. And for now, we'll just hold a moment for others to join. And it's now two o'clock, so we are ready to begin this um, AOCS live stream. Well, welcome to the, the virtual 2020 AOCS annual meeting and expo live stream. I'm Tony Olenek from Nation Technologies Corporation. And in a moment, the AOCS member and annual program chair, Rick Feiner, will uh, provide a comprehensive overview of hard surface cleaner developments with hydrophilic lithophilic difference and net average curvature principles. Well, before that, I get the, uh, the privilege of introducing Rick. I've known Rick quite a while. We both have been a few years between us in the industry. Um, he is the technical applications manager for Avonic, working in uh, North America Business and Innovation Center in Richmond. Uh, Rick earned a Bachelor of Science in Chemical Engineering from Christian Brothers University in Memphis, Tennessee. He additionally has a master's degree in physical chemistry from Lehigh University in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Rick has primarily been working in areas of formulating cleaning compounds for hard surfaces, dishwashing, and laundry and industrial institutional segments. I've also had the privilege of seeing Rick speak in Beersmith uh, on a blog explaining the difference between cleaning and sanitation. And I thank him very much for the contribution to improving my beer. But for the past 16 years, Rick has focused specifically on how to optimize surfactant interactions in cleaning products and related systems. Today's presentation will focus on how utilization of concepts behind HLD and NAC can be combined together uh, with the latter two to provide efficient and effective hard surface cleaning. Questions from live stream discussions will be answered at the conclusion of the presentation, and we look forward to that conversation. Thank you for joining us, and Rick, can't wait to hear. Oh, thank you, thank you very much, Tony, and uh, and thanks for the the plug for my Beersmith uh, talk as well. Um, and thanks everybody for for tuning in. I'm really really uh, pleased to give this presentation. It's something I've been working with for a bit, trying to figure out how to use some of these concepts for uh, cleaner development and make it easier for everybody to try and uh, to try and use this relatively new model for surfactant performance in, uh, in developing cleaning compounds. Uh, what we're gonna talk about today is, first I'm gonna talk about how cleaning is like oil recovery. And um, I'm sure there are a number of folks who get that. Um, others may be wondering what I'm talking about, just bear with me. Um, we're gonna talk about how we're gonna convert the variables typically used in this model for cleaning purposes. We're not going to change them at all, we're just gonna change how we think about them. And we're going to talk about the problems of salinity and soil types and how those come into play and how we can address those. And then we're going to try and put the concepts to work. Uh, and then once we put the concepts to work, of course, we'll figure out and, or we'll take a look and see how well we did. So how is enhanced oil recovery like cleaning? Well, it's very simple. 
when initially the concepts behind the HLD model were pulled together, the idea was to use a surfactant solution in enhanced oil recovery. You see, oil doesn't really want to come out of the ground very easily. Once you've got the pressure of the landmass pushing on that rock formation that has the oil, once it initially gives up that potential energy and you no longer have the oil being pushed out, now you've got to pull it out. And eventually it stops pulling so easily and now we rinse it out by injecting fluids around the production well and the surfactants in those fluids essentially wash the, the um, oil from the rock formation, or at least that's the idea. And that's, that's where Professor Salerjay was going in this PhD dissertation that we used to, or rather he used, to put together the concepts of HLD. So you can see how that's like cleaning. And so using those ideas, we take the equation variables and we see how they're used in terms of the general equation for HLD. We've got our characteristic curvature, our salinity, et cetera, and then we apply them to a cleaning type of situation. In this case, our surfactant is represented by the characteristic curvature. Our builders are represented by the salinity and the alcohol function represents our solvents. Now the temperature of course is always going to be a part of the environment of the, the cleaning process, but there is a very important part, which is soil. The EACN is a part of this formula or this, this equation and it's necessary in order to attain that low interfacial tension that enables better cleaning. So the soil actually has to be considered as its own variable. Now, as we go forward with this, let's simplify and try to make it a little bit easier so that I can make the points I'm trying to make without getting down into the weeds too much. So first we're gonna talk about non-ionic surfactants. So our salinity function becomes a nice and linear function. In this case, uh, 0.13 times the salinity, which is defined in gram sodium chloride per 100 milliliters. We're going to clean at room temperature so we can drop our temperature term. And we're not going to use an alcohol or a glycol ether solvent so we can forget about the alcohol function and the impact it has on the rest of the, of the system. So once we do that, we can break the equation and assume we're looking for that point in which HLD equals zero, the optimal interfacial tension, or rather the minimal interfacial tension. On one side, we've got the formula. Well, once we rearrange, on one side, we've got the formula. And on the other side, we've got the soil and the conditions. So let's look at the formula, because this is what it's all about, right? We want to formulate a cleaning, uh, a cleaning compound. So the characteristic curvature is generally going to be found by references, or if it's not something that's been characterized and published, we can pretty easily determine it via experimentation. The salinity function is easily calculated using gram sodium chloride divided by 100 milliliters times 0.13, or, or is it? The problem is, is that we don't really think about builders in terms of salinity because the builders are their own thing. The builders may be sodium carbonate, they may be sodium hydroxide, sodium citrate, et cetera. And these don't translate well to sodium chloride. So what do we use in order to take up that salinity term? Well, let me explain the concept because it's not difficult and chemists and chemical engineers, I'm sure you're going to pick right up on this. Let's consider that the salinity is expressed in mass per volume. If that's the case, then we can take that and extend it to a molarity, uh, moles per liter. And so with, say, five grams per 100 milliliters, that's half a gram per liter, which we can then find at 0 0.009 molarity. The hidden factor here, though, is the ionic strength, because it's not just about the molar concentration, it's actually about the molar concentration as well as the valences of the ions that are floating around. It may not look obvious because in the case of, develop, of the ionic strength for sodium chloride, it works out to be the same thing. And I'm sure that everybody remembers, or at least will pretend to remember, how we calculate the ionic strength, but to refresh, 
the ionic strength is half of the total of your concentration of the individual ions times the valence squared. If we have 0 0.009 molar of sodium chloride, then that means we have 0 0.009 molar of the sodium ion, and we have 0 0.009 molar of the chloride ion, right? And those are single valences. It works right out. But in the builders, they become a little bit more complicated because they tend to be a little bit more complicated, ionically speaking. This is how I work it out. Our formulas are in percentages. Let's assume that those percentages mean that we can say for half a percent sodium carbonate, it's 0.5 grams per 100 milliliters. It's not exact, but it's close enough to get you there. Once we start taking those values in that manner, we can develop our molarities of our builders, and from there, the molarities of the component ions, and from there, we can work out our ionic strength. And in this case, for this formula, half a percent sodium carbonate, two and a half percent sodium citrate, one percent uh, tetrasodium EDTA, that works out to an ionic strength of 0 0.085. Of course, we're not done. Now we need to use that number properly. So we normalize that ionic strength into a usable value for the HLD equation. We multiply it first by the, mul uh, by the molecular weight of sodium chloride, 58, because sodium chloride is the standard in this formula or in this uh, equation. We divide by 10 to convert 100 milliliters to liters so that we can get the molar term. And then we multiply by 0.13, which is the correlating for, uh, factor for the non-ionic surfactants in this case. That gives us a solidity function of 0.064, and we can back out that 0.13 to get an equivalent salinity of half a, uh, about half a gram per 100 milliliters. Now, at this point, you might be wondering, wait a second, we've got around on an active basis, three and a half percent, or perhaps 3.5 grams per 100 milliliters in our formula, how can that possibly have an equivalent salinity of just half a gram per 100 milliliters? And the answer really comes down to molarity. Remember, the, a lot of these builders are very large molecules, and even though they have very large valences too, that actually corrects it down in such a way that when we compare it to the sodium chloride, it doesn't have as big of an impact. Now, that's easy for me to say, right? Honestly, I had a hard time believing it myself. So I wanted to double check it. So in this case, we put together a very simple salt scan and we said, can we count on this salt scan to behave the way we expect it to behave in this case? We're using the salinity function to, get, to give us 0.064 as we calculated, and we back, uh, run it back through the HLD equation and determine that when we're varying our EACN number, we should see a transition between six and seven. So we then put those tubes together to check. Now I'm going to point out that the oil in this case is actually more dense than water and so it's actually inverted compared to what you would expect to see so in the case of the oil and water uh, emulsions they're actually having the water sitting on top of the oil and on the other side we've got the water and oil at the bottom these weren't given enough time to try really settle and come up to a bicontinuous phase where you see that third phase in the middle. Uh, the reason why is because of, thanks to the lockdown, we didn't get much time into the lab and I was only able to do this at the last minute. But two things really make me think that we did this right. The first of which is the fact that the, uh, the angling of the layers indicates that we're getting a, a more equable distribution as we move to that potential midpoint. The second thing 
that told me that we may be on the right track is the fact that the surfactant, which is kind of yellow tinted, is at the water phase and then it moves to the oil phase, indicating that yes, indeed, the emulsion is shifting from the phases. So that gave us indications that we were down, heading down the right path and we had our value to use. But now we have another value that we need to use in this equation, and that's our soil. How do we represent soil with an EACN number? Standard soils, you know, those are easy to work out. In the case of one that we would commonly use in the lab, utilizing a lot of triglycerides, we could calculate an EACN number of 22. The problem is, is that there really isn't such a thing as a standardized soil. Uh, maybe you can expect to see very similar things in the case of uh, an industrial food plant, perhaps in certain healthcare facilities where you see the same types of soils over and over again. But in the case of my kitchen, it's all over the place. And in the case of my grill, there's no telling where it is. And the question becomes, how are we going to handle the variability in the soil? Well, let's take a practical approach. When our HLD equals zero, we have the lowest theoretical interfacial tension. But it's not a step change, or it's not a, a quantum leap. The interfacial tension between water and oil is quite low, but do we really need to go that low? Could we maybe see good detergency when we're transitioning from our Windsor type one to the Windsor type three where the HLD equals zero? It's not a hard shift and maybe there is just a specific point that we're looking for. And recently there was a very good paper published uh, by an aspiring PhD student at uh, the University of Oklahoma in which she posited that we can aim for an HLD of minus three to zero and still get good results, which means that we now have a margin of error to focus on. Probably we're gonna see the best thing at the HLD of equals zero, but I'll tell you something else is an interesting thing is that once we move into the Windsor type two emulsion, then we no longer see as good detergency. So we really want to take a hard stop at the HLD equals zero. Now, there's another thing that we can do if we're not 100% sure of the EACN, and that is we can bring in a solvent of a known EACN. And why are my slides transitioning? We can, we can t bring in a solvent of a known EACN to try and overwhelm the soil that we're looking at and bring its EACN number in closer to where we want it to be. That's going to be a technique I'm not going to touch on because we just don't have the time here. Instead, we're going to focus on that margin of error that I mentioned. So let's look at the characteristic curvature. I have mentioned the, the grill. And in fact, we, we did a little bit of a video um, that's a little choppy. Uh, but uh, the point is, is that that grill accumulates a lot of triglycerides. And those begin at an EACN number of 22 or thereabouts, but they don't stay there because the grill gets hot, it gets cold, it oxidizes, it comes into contact with acidic smoke, which also brings about saponification. There are all kinds of things going on. And all of those things that are going on are basically turning the soil into something that's a little bit more hydrophilic than the triglycerides themselves. So what I've done here is that I've, I've pointed out some EACNs, and this is using the HLD equation in which we are plotting the characteristic curvature versus the HLD using that salinity function that we worked out. If we look at an EACN number of say 22, and we start plotting in the characteristic curvatures of surfactants, we're going to see a linear response which takes the HLD from zero to minus three. If we continue to do this for the various EACN numbers, then we see those dropping. And it also tells us that in this zone, we can have a, an ideal 
characteristics curvature. So let's start here. Suppose we're looking at something ranging from 14 to minus 5. We can use a characteristic curvature of negative 1 and potentially address that range of HLD 0 to minus 3 and get reasonably good results. I'm not going to say you get great results because I think the more you move in to the zero, the better the results are. So chances are good if your EACN is a negative five or a one or a three, you're going to see a lot better results than you would if it's a 14. If we continue to lower that characteristic curvature of our surfactant, then we're going to continue to move into more, a more hydrophobic range of the soil. And so the goal here is to come up with a surfactant that will bridge the most reliable and realistic range of the EACN of the soils you're going to be encountering. As I mentioned, we had a hard time getting into the lab in order to take a look at this, but I could get to my grill pretty easily. So this is my heat diffuser plate that goes onto my grill so that I don't have really horrible hot spots due to the type of grill I have. And it accumulates a lot of fat. And I slow cook a lot. And so this is probably pretty bad. What our method was, was to put the formula together and to use different characteristic curvatures for the surfactant. We went as high as negative one, and we went as low as negative 2.6. And for the negative one and negative 1.7, we use linear alcohol, alcohol of oxalates. And for the negative 2.6, we looked at linear, branched, and both linear and branched. And what we did was that we basically just ran three milliliters of solution onto individual spots on this plate every 10 minutes for an hour. And after an hour, it still did not look like it was ready to come clean at all. So we used a clean spoon for each spot <laughs> to scrape it. Now, this is not a repeatable test by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, but I do believe that we got some pretty good, interesting res results. If you look at sample number three, you'll see there's a pretty good chunk on that spoon. And that was represented on that diffuser plate. The soil really was softening and beginning to lift off of the plate. It wasn't like I really made a point of scrubbing at this. It was an easy pull from the, you know, from the spoon. In the case of four and five, you, those, they hardly moved. It was, it was difficult to, to really get much up into the spoon, which tells me that even though we were in the right characteristic curvature, there's probably a kinetic difference due to the linear and the branch that is resulting in some type of a synergy for number three. Now the hands down worst appeared to be sample one with his characteristic curvature of negative 1.7, but I think that might partly because in the case of sample two, there was just a big chunk of soil that was sitting there and it came free all at once when the spoon ran across it. I think based on the numbers and, and what I've typically seen in performance testing, that actually sample two might have been the worst. So it, it's supports the idea that we're getting to a more hydrophilic soil. So at this point, the, the, the summary of all of this is basically, wow, the summary of all this is basically to say that what, what we're doing in terms of trying to figure out these terms in putting together uh, the alkaline builders and strengths in order to come up with a salinity function appears to truly have some value here. And it looks like Estimating the soil EACN, if done properly, can bring together a system that can actually work in a given situation. And above all, although getting as close as possible to an HLD of zero is helpful, it's not absolutely necessary. It's enough to use a guiding zone within that curve to get to where you really want to be. Now, the last thing that I, I took away from this is something I've been suspecting for a, a little bit. Uh-oh, battery's running low. Um, is that linear versus branched makes a difference. And I hope to tell you more about that next year once I've had time to really focus more in on it. 
But for the most part right now, I think that it's enough to know that we can use the HLD equation to get to some pretty good cleaning results. Now, I'd like to thank my co-author, Stephanie, um, who is basically my right, right arm in the lab. She is, and not only that, she is a great partner to talk to because she sees things and draws conclusions that I may not, and it's great to be able to work with her. Um, also, I'd like to thank folks at Ivonic, um, specifically my boss, Terry, as well as Mike Williams, who put together most of the samples that we work with. And then Seung, who is my marketing counterpart and is a great help in terms of putting together good presentations and getting information out to the market. Two other people that are very important to me in terms of learning how this all this stuff works is Edgar Acosta and Sonia Natali. And of course, the AOCF staff, they're always fantastic. I have some references in the presentation, I think, that would be very helpful to those of you that would like to delve deeper into this. And that's all I have. Thanks very much for your attention, and I'd love to entertain any questions. Thank you, Rick. That was very interesting. I have a question for you related to looking at this in other type of systems, specifically being in the cosmetic business, cleaning hair, cleaning skin. None of it is ever set up to relate specifically to ability to have detergent properties. Um, the consumer perceives foam as being king for what they do. And generally speaking, if you're foaming, you're 10 times the concentration you needed for detergency. There's such a small amount of oils and things that get on hair. Hair really doesn't get dirty. It gets oil from the skin. And it's a real small amount. Does it make any sense to apply this kind of logic to the detergent side of remo removing those oils, which are fairly well known? and establishing what actually makes it work so that we don't have to use high levels of more irritating kind of sulfates and things like that? Tony, I think that's a great idea and a great, a great way to put that. I think so. And you know what? <laughs> I saw a video at one time of someone using a, uh, what do they call it? It was, it was a, a waterless shampoo is what they called where they rubbed it into their, their hair and then wiped it out. And that just always appalled me because I thought it looked terrible. Um, the result. And um, yes, I think there really is. Um, and I, um, and my slideshow has gone away and I don't know if you guys can still see me. Hopefully you can, but, um, but yeah, I think that, I think perhaps his, his battery died. <laughs> okay. Well, in that case, I think it's probably time to say thank you all very much for being with us today. And uh, thank Rick for putting together uh, a very enlightening uh, presentation and encourage him to keep looking at new things. Uh,